Well, good morning once again, everybody. It is a delight that you're chosen to come here to Cornerstone Church. Let me introduce myself in case I didn't do it already. My name is Eric Bucci, and I am the lead pastor here at Cornerstone. And it's an honor, and it is honestly a privilege that you've chosen to come here today. If this is your first time here, or if you've not been here in a long time, we want to welcome you. Also, everyone that's at home as well, if you cannot be here and you're watching online, we'll let you know that God sees you and God knows you and God loves you, and that's for everybody. Can we do me? A, can you guys do me a big favor and let everyone know how much we appreciate them and love them, nice and loud? All right. We are in a new series. Uh, I'm really excited about it, and I've been challenged. Let me just tell you something. I was really challenged uh, as studying for this message series about the Beatitudes. When Jesus speaks, he says things that are incredible. Well, one word of what Christ says is so profound and so wonderful. And I'm just really excited about this series. And I believe today is one of the most important messages I'll ever bring before you. I mean that sincerely. I know I say that almost every single week. I guess that's a good thing that I believe that. But I really do believe this is like the key almost to everything. Next to salvation in Jesus Christ, this is a key that brings us into God's favor and presence like nothing else. We'll be talking about it in a few moments as we're getting into the Beatitudes. Before we do that, I just want to mention that Christmas is right around the corner. I think it's like eight or nine weeks left, praise the Lord. Yeah. And, uh, and so we want to go ahead and uh, we're going to have uh, five Christmas services coming up. And we're going to ask you to pray about that. We're, we're believing God to reach over 1,500 people uh, in person here. And more online, we're believing for hundreds of people to have an opportunity to give their lives to Christ. And we're believing that God is going to do an amazing work over this holiday season where people are looking for hope. And that's going on. If you want to participate in that, love to have you part of it. Also, uh, we want to be able to feed and help folks. We're having that, um, that uh, food drive. And so we're having it right here at the church. We want to encourage you to participate with that. As you walk out of here today, there are bags and also... Um, the Operation Christmas Child, which is so much fun. It's such a blessing. And you'd be amazed the impact it makes. And so we want to give as many as we can. I, I would like to see us do, well, I'd like to see us do thousands of them if we can. But uh, we'll see what we can do. Let's take as many as we can. We want to be able to touch and, and touch children around the world. Okay, let's uh, get back to our new series called The Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. And uh, the Beatitudes, by the way, comes from the Latin. It actually means blessed. That's all it means. But I like what it actually sounds like, the B attitudes. And I think that's also correct. If you and I have these attitudes, it will change our life. I sincerely believe that. And these attitudes, by the way, is not just, just like um, positive thinking. This is what Jesus actually teaches. This is what Jesus actually teaches. You might, you might have heard this before. Your, your attitude determines your emotional altitude. And I think that's true. Your attitude determines your altitude. The problem with that, however, is this. You can have the greatest attitude in the world and be at a great altitude internally, but you might be living a lie. Right? Absolutely. So your own environment may be something you're living, but you might be living in a dream instead of reality. But this is more accurate, actually. It is accurate. Setting your attitudes on God's beatitudes will bring you to heaven's altitude. And that's what this series is all about. It's all about getting our attitudes, what we think, what we feel, aligned with God's beatitudes. And those beatitudes will take you to God's altitude. It'll take you to a place that beyond this earth. I don't know about you, but I want to live beyond this earth. I'm tired of trying to rely upon what's around me and before me. I want to rely on God. And let me just say that this message might be a little bit uh, hard to hear today. But sometimes the, the things we need to hear the most are the hardest to hear. And I want to make something very, very clear. This is not about legalism. This is about relationship. But there's, there's a fallacy that we are believing and that we're ingesting that's causing us to be sick. And God wants to set us free. I believe next to salvation in Jesus Christ, if you and I get this in us today, it's going to change our life. Thank you, all three of you. Jesus and the greatest sermon ever. It's found in chapters 5 to 7 in the book of Matthew. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Phenomenal. In fact, we had an opportunity a couple of years ago to go to, to, go to Israel. And um, 
This is the Church of the Beatitudes. Actually, it's actually, it's actually dedicated to the preface of the... This is the beginning of the sermon, like the introduction. And we were at this beautiful place. But there was a, there was a cantankerous nun that was there, however. Boy, she, shh. I'm trying to... Shh. I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. Apparently, she's not the only one. That she, I thought I was the only one, but I talked to my other friends. Oh, yeah, we know who she is. I'm sure Jesus loves her, but, man, she was neat. Anyhow... <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, well, the Church of the Beatitudes, and what it is, it's uh, actually on a hillside, and this is actually what it looks like. It's the Sea of Galilee. There's, it's, it's what it looks like, and Jesus was. We don't know. We're not quite sure if this is the actual place, but as you look around the lake, the Sea of Galilee. It's not really a sea; it's a big lake. It, it, the logical places he could have spoke would probably be here. And, and, and actually, if you'd be interested in going to Israel again, we'd love to take you. And, of course, there's some situations going around the world right now, if you're not familiar with it, that limits travel a little bit. But I would love to take another trip. It is a incredible time. And we're looking to do another trip, but this time a little bit different. This time, instead of just going to the ancient sites where Jesus was and the land of the Bible, we're also going to go to the local churches of that area. We want to talk to the, what God is doing now. And... Uh, Imagine someone comes to your house and, hey, show me your, show me your family photos. I'm like, what? Don't you want to talk to me? No, no. Just, let me see. And we show them the family photos and, and show about what happened in the past, but we never talk to the people that are in the house. I think that's something that is lost in some of these tours. We just go there. But we really want to make it different this time. We want to go and actually meet the church that's going on right now. And so I'm going to talk right now with some of our missionaries about how we can do that. If you're interested in, the, in that, let us know. And we'll put something together. But right now we're looking at the, you know, the situation in the world. I'm not even going to mention it because if I do, there'll be a, a tag at the bottom of the sermon. And I don't want it there. You know, the thing. <laughs> okay. That's what we call it here. We call it the thing. <laughs> All right. Now, we come to the Sermon on the Mount, and, and, and Jesus is speaking to the people. And let's just go ahead. What we're going to do is we're going to read it, the first couple of verses. We're going to go through it. All right. And here's Jesus now. He's, he's healing the sick. He's doing incredible stuff. And people begin to follow him. He has a crowd about and around him. And this is what the scripture says in Matthew 5, 1 through 10. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. So apparently he saw a multitude of people that started to follow him. But what he did is he climbed higher. He climbed higher. And what happened? His disciples followed him. I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to be like the rest of the crowd that's at the bottom. I want to climb and go where Jesus is. I don't want to go where the crowd is. I want to go where Jesus is. And what happened was his disciples left the crowds behind and went up to speak to Jesus, to hear Jesus. And this is what Jesus did. So he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Now, we have his 12, right? We had a 72. We had a uh, we had over 100. We had 500. And so we had disciples. We know about the 12 primarily and the, and the 3 and the 1. And so Jesus is speaking to his disciples. This is like an in-house meeting. But I, the other crowds began to also come up the mountain as well. But he's speaking to his disciples. And what he did, it says he was seated and his disciples came to him. And that's what they used to do in the rabbinic traditions. The rabbi would sit and the people would stand. So I think what we're going to do today, I'm going to relax. And you guys are going to stand the whole service. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. I, actually, I did, a, I did a funeral. Not a funeral. I did a, uh, a wedding. Same thing, right? <laughs> actually, you have to die to yourself when you get married. It's a wonderful experience. But I actually, did a, I actually did a wedding. I almost did it again. And, uh, and I, the people were standing up, and I never told them to sit down. And they were there for 45 minutes, and one guy collapsed. It was fantastic. <laughs> so I won't do that to you. But that's what they would do. And incidentally, oh, we believe they did that so people wouldn't fall asleep. Aren't you glad we don't do that today? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So Jesus sat down as a rabbi. And they stood up and listened to him. They were intent on him. And I'm going to go ahead and read the Beatitudes. And we're going to go back and look at the first phrase, okay? In about eight weeks this series will be. Seven more after this one. 
So he went up in the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. That's what we need. We need to come to Jesus, everybody. That's the answer. In fact, I was asking God, God, what are we going to do at Cornerstone Church in this new year with the pandemic and all of this and people? And I, what strategy should we have, God? What gimmick should we have? And this is what the Lord told me this past week really strongly. Don't worry about that. Lift me up, and I will draw the men. Amen? So uh, you're going to hear a lot more about Jesus because that's what it's all about, everybody. We want to lift Jesus up, and he'll draw the people. People are longing for Christ. They're longing for him. And I pray not just Cornerstone Church. I pray every church lifts up the name of Jesus, and every church is packed and full of people coming to know Christ because we're not the only church. He is the only church. Amen? So he was seated. His disciples came to him, and then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. We could use a lot more of those. For they, oh, we can't wait till we do this one. Okay, sorry. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now today, blessed are the poor in spirit. When I used to read these, I thought it was just Jesus talking about groups of people. You know, the poor people, God bless them. Well, we're not those. You know, we, yeah, bless the poor, God. Go ahead and bless them. I don't, I don't want to be part of that, but you go ahead and bless the poor, Jesus. Oh, yeah, the meek, yeah, bless them as well. But, you know, people are gifted with different types of, there are people out there that are very meek. There are people that are poor in spirit. You know, God has given us the poor. I'm not one of them, so it's, it's cool, right? There are people that are, you know, so those are good. And so those are different, different groups that Jesus is talking about, and we're, we're part of that. Nope. He's talking to every single one of you and I that have given our lives to Christ. And if you haven't, this, you'd still benefit from this. This is not, this is the Beatitudes. This is not like pick and choose. This is not like the Ten Commandments where people choose. No, <laughs> you're not supposed to do that. It's all ten. And he's asking us, this is what I'm commanding you to do. Okay, and so we're going to start today. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, what does it mean, blessed mean? Blessed would mean, some people translate it happy, which that's not really good translation. What it really means is blessed, accepted, and, and ingested, if you will, and accepted completely and having the benefits thereof of God himself. Now, that's a pretty good blessing. How many of you like to be blessed like that? Absolutely, right? Blessed. Blessed, I mean, everything you need, God's blessing you. It doesn't mean a bigger house or a bigger car or a dog that doesn't bark. It doesn't mean that. But what it means is that God is giving you his acceptance and he is, he is enveloping you as his own and you are blessed. You are a part of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And I'm like, oh, gee whiz, I mean, do, are we supposed to be poor? Is that what God wants for us? Oh, gosh, I knew I didn't like Christianity. I, I don't want to be poor. Well, the truth of the matter is, maybe it may be so. It may be so. There was a man that came to Jesus, a rich, young ruler. And he came to Jesus. What must I do? I do all the commandments, he says. Jesus said, you lack one thing. Go sell everything you have and come follow me. And the man walked away poor. I wonder today... I'm not suggesting we all do this, but if God tells you to, you've got to be willing to do that. Are you willing to lay it all behind? So I'm giving it all away. Ushers, ready to take the offering? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There are people that do that, and that's wicked. That's manipulation. But we have to be willing to do that. We have to be willing to let. It wasn't just the riches. It was whatever took the place of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. How many of you want to have the kingdom? Kingdom of God. That means God's government. You want God's government? I don't know about you, but I'm not really crazy about our government. It's not so good, is it? Aren't you glad we get to heaven one day? We won't have different parties. It'll be one party, the Jesus party. And I'm going to be partying a lot up there. Amen? Aren't you? 
No more lawn signs. Woo. Don't get me started. I have a story to tell you. I'm not going to tell you right now. Maybe a couple years from now when it's over with. But anyhow, talk to me privately. I'll tell you the story. Okay. Blessed are the poor. <laughs> it's funny. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. I don't know. I want to be in the kingdom of heaven. I I'm not really that impressed with the United States of America. I'm not really impressed with any other government. I want to be in God's government. I want to be in a government that never ends. Amen. And so this is what God would have. Now, what does that mean, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven? Well, there's a book that everyone, this is like the philosophy of our culture. This is about 100 years ago. This guy named Ralph Waldo. With a name like Waldo, you can't trust him. Emerson said the following. This is what he said. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to, the iron, to that iron string. Discontent is the want of self-reliance. It is infirmity of will. Just follow your heart. Follow your heart. Find the God within. You are God. Enjoy it. So don't put that on YouTube and get me fired. Here's another one that's recent. Trust your instincts and make judgments on what your heart tells you. The heart will not betray you. Can I hear, oh no? <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, you know, it's your truth. It's just whatever you feel. I mean, be true to thyself. Follow your heart. It will lead you. I want us following my heart. Oh, I'm so holy. No, that's not. That's not. You know what, what Jeremiah says? God says, the heart is wonderful above all things, and you can follow it, and you'll have a great life. Three Brucci, 17. No? That's not what it says, does it? No, what does it say? The heart, the epicenter of the human condition. The heart is what? Deceitful. What does deceitful mean? Trickery. And I, I mentioned it before, when, you are, when you're in deception, you're not even aware of it. So you might think you have the right heart, but you may not. That's why, that's, you can't trust your heart. You can't trust your feelings. You can't trust your mind. You can't trust anybody. Aren't you glad you came to church? Yes, you can't trust anybody. Why? The heart is deceitful above all things. Not your neighbor, not somebody else, but the heart. Yes, your heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately sick. All of us need to go to the cardiologist of heaven who can understand it. The longer I'm alive, I've been alive a little longer than I'd like to admit this morning. But the longer I'm alive, the less arrogant I become. I am so humble now. I can barely stand it. All kidding aside, the more I'm alive, the more I realize, oh my Lord, I need you, God. I thought I knew stuff. I thought I knew how to do things right. The more I'm alive, the closer I get to God, the more naked I feel without him. So the heart is deceitful above all things. So th this world is wrong about these things, everybody. And you know what, <laughs> you know what Jesus says to the Lay Laodicea church? First we said, I'll spew at him. I wish you were hot or cold. I wish you would just follow me or not follow me. But because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Now, what about Jesus, the nice, I want to talk about the nice Jesus. Where, where's the nice Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes? Where, where's, G where, where's that guy at? He's not here right now. This is not the same Jesus you, that, that the world depicts. Jesus is extremely strong and powerful. And the things he says got him killed because he messed with the religion of his day. And I think if we mess with the religion of our day, people are going to be upset. And this might upset you. It might upset me. And that's a good thing. You say, Jesus says, I am rich. I have everything I want. You know, make no mistake, the United States of America, my friends, we've hit the lottery. We're like the top 2 or 3% of the world. we got it going on. The fact that we can overeat and oversleep and all the things that we do, we got it going on pretty well. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He's basically saying your spiritual condition is Wretched, poor, and blind, and naked. 
That's what Jesus is saying to the church that thinks they have it all together. That's what he's saying to the church that says, oh yeah, we're better than those other people. We're better than that other party. We're better than the other church. We're better than those other people. We have our act together. We vote this way. We do this way. And we are better. Those people are sinners. We're better. And we're, we're righteous. And, and righteous indignation. And we have a right to speak what we speak. And sometimes the most putrid and disgusting people in the world is the church without Jesus. A judgmental church is disgusting, and so is a passive church is disgusting. Both are not Christ. So he's saying you're wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. Isn't that encouraging? Okay? Being poor in spirit is the master key to living in the kingdom of heaven. I have a master key for this church and go anywhere I want in the church. And one day I lost it, surprise, and I had another key, and I could only go into certain doors. You want the master key of heaven? You want to go in every single room and promises of God. You know what the key is? It's this first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. When you and I get to the point, being poor in spirit is the master key to the kingdom of heaven. This is, the, the Beatitudes don't work. The Sermon on the Mount does not work without this first key. This first key is, is first for a reason. It's the master key to living the Christian life. It's the master key of being everything that God called us to be. How many of you want to have that master key? I do. Let me just confess to you, I'm not living in this like I want to. Let me just confess to you that I was, I was convicted this past week looking at this. And I recognize that I've been deceived and that I need to go deeper in the Lord. And looking at this, we must live like a beggar. Now, we have some people that are in corners when we'll work for food and have all that out there. Now, but I've been to other countries where there are people that are really begging, beggars. They have no money. And when this was written, by the way, uh, about begging and, and beggars in the time of Christ, they would be out there and they would beg. And what basically they got for that day is all they had. And they'd come tomorrow, and they'd come the next day. And there might be a beggar there for 20 or 30 years if, if they don't die. They're begging for something, and they're relying on what they're given. Now, I don't know about you. I don't like that very much. But what the Bible is saying, the words used in the Greek, and the inference of it is simply saying this. The best translation I can find as I look at this and as I look at the context is, blessed are those that are begging for God. What? That's legalism. Let me, let me verify what I'm saying and let me kind of clarify and verify. We're not talking about a monastic movement. We're not talking about people in the Philippines that on Good Friday are getting themselves nailed to the cross with surgical steel trying to appease Jesus Christ. We're not talking about people sleeping cold on naked floors and, and, and wearing burlap. We're not talking about people whipping themselves with whips and trying to climb staircases with their knees at the 1,200 feet in the air going to a monastery to please God. That's not what we're talking about. That is legalism as well what we're talking about is getting to the point that we're like a beggar on the street that if I don't get something I'm not going to survive I, I, I'm going to rely so much on God God I need it beggar blessed are the poor in spirit the very beginning the very key to everything my friend is to be at a point where we absolutely have to have God above all else are we there yet? I confess, I don't think I am to the degree I want to be. Do I get there sometimes? Yeah, I've been there when everything fell apart in my life. Sometimes the best place to be is when you have nothing else that you can rely upon except for God. Finally, we wake up. Tim Keller has pancreatic cancer, the pastor from New York City, an author, and he says, I thank God for the cancer I have. Not that God wanted, but I finally get it that he's all I need. I think I'm just, he, he didn't say I have it. He said, I think I'm starting to understand what that means. Why not learn it here? Why not listen to the word of God? We must be like a beggar. You see, Jesus tells a story of the religious of his day, and we can be the same way. I can't believe those people are doing that. They're doing this. They're doing this, this theory and this theory and the other, and they're not taking care of the poor. Or they're getting, oh, oh, and, and all this kind of stuff. They should be canceled. We're talking around. We're looking at, and you notice everyone's accusing everyone, and everyone's better than everyone else, right? 
I've evolved and you are Neanderthal. You're no good. And we begin to, to criticize each other. And Jesus talks about a situation in the temple of a parable. It does the following. But the tax collector, tax collector, by the way, is the wretched of the wretched. Tax collector would be someone of Jewish descent, a person who's Jewish. And their job, they work for the Roman government. And what they would do, suppose you owed $100 a month to the government. Well, this tax collector would take $200. And if you don't like it, he'll tell Rome and take more from you. So this guy betrayed you and took advantage of you, and he was one of you. The guy's scum of the earth with the tax collectors, okay? You think April 15 is bad. You haven't seen nothing yet. This is what these guys were. And the Pharisee, was, and he talks earlier, was there praying, thank you, God, that I'm not like this tax collector. And this Pharisee uh, memorized the first five books of the Old Testament. You could tap him and say, can you tell me about Deuteronomy? Moses came down from the mountain, and he began to quote the whole thing verbatim. They knew the scripture backward and forward. And they were very, very, very astute. And they wore these long robes. And they criticized Jesus. And they were very legalistic minded. I thank you I'm not like the rest. I thank you, Father, that I'm not like those people. I thank you I'm not like that other voting block. I thank you that I'm not like those people in that country. I thank you I'm not like those people that live that lifestyle. I thank you, God, that I'm better than these people. Thank you, Father, God, that you saved me from that. But the tax collector, what did the tax collector do? The tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even to lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow and saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you this sinner, I tell you this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Will be exalted. Jesus is making very, very clear here what we're talking about. This person was poor of spirit. This person understood where they were at. You see, holiness without brokenness is legalism. You can do everything right, everything right, but if you have, if you don't have brokenness in your life, it's legalism. I heard a pastor say, and I agree, I never trusted a man or a woman who didn't have a limp. In other words, if someone hasn't wrestled with God, I'm not quite sure I trust them yet because they're too self-reliant upon themselves. We have to get to the place that unless God shows up, we fail. That's how we have to live. Holiness without brokenness is legalism. This is what we see going on in our culture, sometimes in our churches today. We must have the attitude of Jesus for heaven's Altitude. What was Jesus? What was Jesus? What was Jesus' attitude? Had the same attitude that was of Christ. Although was equal to God. Did not, Philippians chapter 2, did not equate godliness with something to be grasped, but emptied himself, becoming that of a bondservant. Jesus emptied himself. If he had, he, he's a never sinned, never did anything wrong, and he said, I am going to lower myself. He was the most humble person that ever was on this earth. He had every reason to be prideful, but he humbled himself, obedient, obedient to the point of death. That's the attitude of being poor in spirit. Jesus was the embodiment of someone being poor in spirit. Now, if Jesus found it necessary to be poor in spirit, why do we think we, have, we, can't, we don't have to be? I'm wondering about that, right? In John 5, 19, Jesus tells us about his relationship with the Father and how poor spirit he really is. He says the following. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do some things on his own. What does it say? Nothing. And nothing in Greek means? Thank you. The Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he saw the Father. No? Doesn't say saw either, does it? Not past tense. Doesn't say what he will see. Oh, God, one day I'll, I'll obey you. No, no. He does nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees. Present, continuous action is the Greek verb tense there. Jesus only does, does what he sees the Father doing. He does nothing on his own accord. He completely relies upon God. Only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. That is, 
a poverty spirit. That's a beggar spirit. Unless you move, I will not move. No, I'm not suggesting you lay in bed in the morning. I'm not going to move until God tells me to get out of bed. Holy Spirit, tell me to get out of bed. Why don't you get out of bed? Oh, I'm waiting for God to tell me. You'll get a shoe across the head uh, if you're living in my house. No, we're not talking about that. That's silliness. But there has to be a posture where we constantly believe that he is the way. This is what Jesus says in John 15, 5. This is what Jesus talks about us. I am the vine, you're the branches. He who abides. Not just abides means living in. It means attached to. If I have a light bulb and I unplug it, what happens to that light bulb? It goes out. That's the kind of dependence God wants us to have. Plugged into him. But I'm a self-made man. You're going to be a self-made man. You're not going to be a godly man or a godly woman. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him. He bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. nothing. And when Jesus says nothing, he means nothing. He's not impressed with our church services. He's not impressed with you memorizing scripture verses. He's not impressed with your tithing and giving. He's not impressed with mission trips. He's not impressed with all the wonderful things you do. If you're not connected to him and you're not relying on him, it means nothing to him. He's not impressed. And this is what Jesus has to say to us. I, I want to just conclude with a couple of things. The book of Job is the most, one of the most fascinating books in the Bible. In fact, it's the oldest book in the Bible. Job was around before Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There was no Bible when Job was around. There was no synagogue. There was no preacher. There was nothing. There was no podcast. There were no iPhones, okay? He was all by himself in a culture where Christianity and Judaism wasn't even founded yet. And he was a godly man. He prayed for his kids every day. He helped the poor. He goes on and on. But yet, if you don't know the story, by the way, I heard someone that said, I, I, I thank you so much for giving me the Bible. I've been looking for a job for the last three weeks, and I opened the book, and I found a job. Thank you. So the suffering of Job, he, he went, he lost, he, this is what happened, he lost all his kids. He lost all his cattle, his bank account. He lost everything. Satan came to God. He said, hey, look at all these people here messed up. Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him. He's blameless in every way. Yeah, that's because you've blessed him with a lot of stuff. Take his stuff away and see what happens. Then he'll curse you. I think of God, I think if the enemy were to come up today, this is what he'd say to God. Hey, God, why don't you go ahead and bless these people and see if they'll follow you. Sometimes the biggest test is when you're blessed. When you have everything. But he said basically that. So what happened? He lost everything. He said, naked I came from my womb. Naked I will go. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and takes away. He worshiped God. He goes back to God. Hey, hey God, take his health. Then we'll see what happens. So he loses his health. He's so sick he wants to die. He gets broken pottery. And he's sca scraping his skin off these boils that are all over him. To make matters worse, he has the church come to help him. The first week was amazing. They shut up and just sat there. Sometimes, my friends, that's the best thing to do sometimes is to say nothing and just be there when someone's going through a hard time. Don't tell them, I think God needed a flower in heaven so he plucked your mother and brought her home. That's just stupid. You're being judgmental. Well, I can in this case. <laughs> okay. Don't say stuff like that. I know you mean well. The best thing to do is... Okay. Those that said shut up, you need to check your heart. The suffering of Job. He goes through a difficult time. And, and look at Job. He talks about who he is. And his friends come to him and preach him. And all the things his friends say, by the way, are amazing sermons. The problem is, it's a misdiagnosis. They're giving him medication that's not even appropriate for him. Everything they're saying is true, except for the fact it's under the wrong context. And in the wrong context. But look what, the, look what he did. This is, look what Job did. Look what kind of guy he was. This is what he said later on. And he's, later on, he gets frustrated. God, why, am, why are you doing this to me? I've done everything right. Now you start to see the weakness of Job. For I assisted the poor in their need and the orphans who required help. He also says, I took care of justice. I did wonderful things. I was a father to the poor and assisted strangers who needed help. He goes on to say even this. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look at lust at a young woman. So he sat pure. And you know what he even says? If I've ever lusted and looked at any woman, may another man have my wife. And may, that's what he says. I don't know a person in this room or on earth that's married would say that. 
That's how holy the guy was. He had his stuff together, okay? Which is the problem. Job, according to what I've read and what I've looked at, he, and you'll see in a few minutes, he was not poor in spirit completely. Well, I'll show you what I'm talking about. When what God does, God shows Job everything. Where were you, Job? Where were you when I formed the earth? And he sees the glory of God. He gets a pinhole view of who God is, and he's completely undone. My friends, I'm convinced of this. People say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a talk with God. No, you're not. You're going to be like, oh. You any questions? Nope. <laughs> Nothing? Nope. That's what's going to happen. And I've been in times of worship where I was so messed up with things, and I got in God's presence to such a degree that I had not a worry in my heart. I'm like, it's okay. It is well. It is well within my soul. And then about 10 minutes later, all my, that the stuff started coming back in my mind, I started getting fr frustrated again. When you, I'm telling you right now, the answer to everything is the presence and the person of Jesus Christ. That is the answer. You're not going to ask any questions. How can people suffer that are good? Because no one's good. And if you got what you deserved, and I got what I deserved, we'd all be killed and we'd be in hell. That's what you and I deserve. How can you say that? It's in the scriptures. It's true. If you think you're all that in a bag of chips, you're not. Okay? And so I have nothing more to say. He was like, I have nothing more to say. I've seen God. I've seen God. He goes on. Jesus talks about this, about, about a servant who, what happens when a servant does everything? Does the master thank him for it? No. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded to him? I think not, Jesus said. I, we just did what you called us to do, and that's all we did. We don't require anything else. He said, that's the kind of attitude you should have. But I tithe, and I give, and I help people. I was nice to that person. You know, I heard of a story of a man that was going through a marital difficulty, and him and his wife, and uh, she was a believer. He was not, and he kept trying to proselytize and bring her to Christ, and she wasn't coming to Christ, wasn't coming to church, and she kept trying and trying. Finally, she said, okay, I'm not going to try anymore, and she just basically asked him again. He said, will you stop asking me to go to church? So he left, and she, she liked to pray out loud. So the husband went out to the back of the house when she went into the bedroom, and he listened to her to pray. You know what she said? Lord God, show me how I'm not being a good wife to my husband. Show me how I am being, I'm not doing what's right. Lord, show me how I can be more compassionate. Show me, God, how I can make a difference. Lord, change me. I'm asking you to change my heart, for my heart is not right. I have my own, I, I have my own desires that are even beyond what you want. And she began to pray like that. You know what happened to the husband? He melted and he gave his life to Christ. That's what the world needs. And that is self-congratulatory church that thinks you need to be like us. Until you and I have a poverty spirit, it's never going to work. Back in Job, after the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Elipaz, that, I call him the termite, the termite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job. What did Job say? I have nothing left to say. God you're God. And these other guys had all great sermons. The world does not need another sermon. What the world needs is a church and a persons that have a broken and a poverty spirit that can finally speak with power because our heart is in the right place. Amen? So these guys, so Elipaz, the, the termite, Bilad, the Shunite, and Zophar, and whatever this person says, did as the Lord commanded them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Why? He got to the place. His friends were so judgmental. He says, I want you to pray for your friends. I want to encourage you as we conclude right now as John makes his way up. I want to encourage you with something today. I want to ask you a question, and I ask myself the same question. Do I have a poverty spirit? Do I have a poverty spirit? And I can honestly tell you, I do not to the, re to the place I should. I have moments, but I haven't arrived yet. But I, wanna, I want to arrive. I want to get to that place, everybody. And it isn't a place that you, you, you get one time, you end. It's constantly. It's like swimming. When you first start to swim, you can't really swim very well, right? But then there's a person that can swim. They're floating on their back, 
and it's easy, if you and I will practice a poverty spirit, I believe it's possible that you and I can have the kingdom of heaven like we've never experienced before. And that we can walk in power knowing that we're serving God. Therefore, the Bible says, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. One time I was in prayer and I was praying this. God, I want to, I want to, Lord, I'm going to resist the devil and submit to you. And then I read the rest of this and it spoke to me one day. It really opened my heart. It was one of those moments where the Lord spoke to me through scripture powerfully like he often does. But this one really cut me to the heart. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you, right? Amen? Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. You know, the Apostle Paul, at the end of his life, in 1 Timothy, said this, I am the chief of sinners. Why could the Apostle Paul say that? Because he understood the closer he gets to God, the more he sees he's in poverty. If you think that you're better than anybody else in the world, you don't have a poverty spirit. You have a legalistic spirit, and no one wants to listen to someone like that. If not by the grace of God, I'm no better than the Taliban. If not by the grace of God, I'm not better than anyone else out there. But because of God, I have hope. A poverty spirit. I need God. What am I without Him? Humble yourselves in the sight of God. And He will lift you up. Let's stop trying to lift ourselves up. I know better. No, I am naked. I am poor. I am wretched. Without God, I am worth nothing. Do you know what freedom that is, everybody? When we get to the point, don't try to be anything anymore. You don't have to be. You're nothing. Welcome to the club. I'm worthless without God. But with God, I'm accepted. You see the difference, everybody? When you understand your depravity, you don't sit around like those people over there. How dare they? Oh, shut up. And I say shut up to myself as well. Do I have a poverty of spirit? The last thing we need is a judgmental church that points at everybody instead of God. See, this is the truth. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see, there's no condemnation on it. We're walking Christ. My question to you and my question to myself today, do we have a poverty spirit? I don't know about you, but I want to have one. That's the key to, to it all, everybody. That's the key that Jesus had. That's the key the Apostle Paul had. And it's a key that God wants to give us. It's the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Is having this poverty spirit. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, maybe I'm the only one here today. Maybe I'm not. But I stand here today, the pastor of this church, recognizing that my spirit is not in poverty like it should be. Father, I recognize today, and I pray others would recognize as well, Lord, we don't just want to hear a message and go, okay, I get that, and do it for 20 minutes. But Father, we want to do what you said, Jesus, that if we want to follow, we must pick up our cross and die daily. God, we thank you that there's freedom in you, that when we are in poverty, we truly have riches. That it was not for you, none of us could stand. It's by grace we've been saved, not by works that any of us can boast. Father, I pray you'd break that religious, pharmaceutical spirit thinking like we think we're better than anybody else. If not for your grace, who could stand? Lord, we want to humble ourselves before you. We ask for forgiveness, Father, for trying to use you to get stuff, for trying to bargain with you. Like little children, we want to put away childish ways. We want to recognize that we are paupers. We are blind beggars along the side of the street without you. But with you, we are your children. We're accepted in Jesus' name. So, Lord, change our heart. Lord, we want to lift you up here at Cornerstone Church, God. 
We want to lift you up that you would draw all men. Father, we want to make sure that you are lifted up. We're not lifted up. Our ministry is not lifted up. Our worship's not lifted up. Our teaching and our sermons and our building and our programs. No, God, we want you to be lifted up, go God. For apart from you, we can do nothing. God, let us be a church with a poor spirit. For thus is the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name. Let me ask you a question today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you were to die right now, do you absolutely know you'd be in heaven with Christ? And you think, I'm a pretty good person. No, you're not. We just determined today, we showed you today that no one has their act together. There's not one that's righteous. No, not one. There's only one hope for you and I. And that is a life surrendered to Jesus Christ. Have you given your life to Jesus? If you haven't, you're not saved. Today's the day of salvation. You have to be willing to give up your life. You don't have to get your act together. All you have to do is get your surrender together. And all you have to do is put the white flag of surrender. I surrender, God. I hand you the deed of my life. If you're willing to do that, today is the day of salvation. Maybe you used to walk with God and you're not walking anymore. Maybe you've never completely given your life to Christ. Today is the day of salvation. I'm going to pray a prayer. I want to include you in that prayer. And if that's you today, could you just raise your hand nice and high? We had several in the last service. And say, Pastor, I've never given my life to Christ, but today I want to. Or I want to get right. I'm not walking on the right path. Let's be honest. Anyone this morning would say that in this service. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, anyone in line? Let's pray this prayer out loud together. It's the prayer with your heart that makes a difference. Lord Jesus, go ahead. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died, and I believe you rose again. Today, I step down from being in charge of my life. I give you my life. Take my life. It is yours. I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And I choose to stay, to follow you. Come, Holy Spirit, to fill my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you came born again today. In the front pocket of your seat, there's a card. You want to pull that out, and you can put it on there, my decision today. Also, if you want to get your phone out, there's another way you can do it. You can text us. You can text 860-499-4888. That's 860 860- 499-4888 and write believe and we'll give you the next prompts at the end of the service today we'll have people up here for prayer or the front desk we want to help you along the way listen we're just like you we're on our journey together God has good plans for us a hope and a future in Him and we are a bunch of people following Jesus and that's what it's all about we want to help you on Tuesday night we have something called Fresh Start to help you on your journey and there's other things we can do as well may the Lord bless you May he fill you with his grace and peace. And may you rely on the fact that he is all that you need. Be poor in spirit and be rich in God in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys.